most of you will have joined. So let me begin with a very warm welcome to everyone for this evening's Dr. Hamid Frontiers in Chemistry alumni webinar. Considering that there are over 200 of you who've joined us, it seems appropriate to welcome you with a little bit more granularity on behalf of the head of department, Dr. James Keeler, and my many academic colleagues, and to say good afternoon to those of you further afield, good morning to those of you as far away as Australia, and good evening, those of you in the United Kingdom, Europe, and Africa. This is the first of a number of scheduled webinar events that have been supported by Dr. Yusuf Hamid, and they're intended to connect the department with our alumni and friends around the world. We're extremely grateful to Dr. Hamid for his support of our many endeavors in the department and to help our department, the Yusuf Hamid Department of Chemistry, to remain as one of the best in the world. The theme this evening is Women in Chemistry, and it's apt that we're holding this event in February. It's the month in which we are also seeing the world celebrating the United Nations um, um, event, which is based around, let me get the, so it's on the 11th of February, the United Nations 7th International Day of Women and Girls in Science. The theme this year is equality, diversity, and inclusivity, water unites us. And also on the 16th of February, we celebrate the IUPAC Global Women's Day. And it's the first time in two years that in the department, we will have a breakfast, an in-person breakfast, where our students, researchers, um, and, and those who work in the department can gather in person um, to celebrate this rather special um, event. So the theme, Women in Chemistry, um, is one that has been connected to a number of panel events um, over the years. And we think this, if we're going to be a fantastic place in which to work, learn, and to carry out research, we feel that the way that we're going to do this is to try and understand and address the underrepresentation of women and the obstacles they've encountered in the STEM subjects. And by making the department a better place for our women, those coming and those who are here, we have a better chance of providing an inclusive and rewarding environment for absolutely everyone. Now, at the beginning, in terms of formalities, um, you were informed that the first half um, of, of this recording, of this, of this presentation will be recorded. Um, the second half, the Q&A will not. Those of you who wish to submit questions can do so with the Q&A uh, Q function that's on the screen. You can do this as you go through the, um, the webinar and um, or at the very end. And, at the, and, and I will choose questions to, to um, address to those who are speaking tonight, our two excellent speakers. The recorded component today will be available on the department's YouTube channel, where you will also find some other recordings uh, in a diverse range of topics for, um, given by our colleagues. And it's a great way to allow those who are either alumni or friends or those who are coming to the department and want to see what we do, the remarkable people that are doing the work. So let me begin by introducing um, the two speakers tonight. And what we've tried to do, and Diane Harris, who's been um, arranging these events for a number of years, does a great job in attracting some fantastic speakers. And tonight's speakers are really, are really wonderful in so many ways. The clarity of their thinking, the eloquence of their presentation, the science they do. The first is Melinda Dewar. Melinda is a professor of biological and biomedical chemistry. She came to Cambridge as an undergraduate and has had an incredible academic career. She began as a physical inorganic chemist, but has moved on to now look at the development um, and science of the development of tissue, molecular structure, organic matrices, mineral components in bone, and also how they're implicated in degenerative diseases. She has started a company called Cambridge Oncology. Um, I really like and admire all my colleagues, and it's a privilege to work with so many people in Cambridge. But I, I place Melinda in a small group of people who I respect and admire enormously for the quality of their science, their humanity, and their friendship. So it'd be wonderful to hear from her in the first instance. Our second speaker is no less distinguished. Charlotte Allerton began her career in Nottingham, and she came to Cambridge to complete her MPhil with Professor Ian Patterson. Now, Ian, I've heard him speak on a number of occasions about his pride in the many students who've come through his group and how they've gone on to do great things. And he's spoken of Charlotte's ability as a scientist as being really one of the best that's come to the group. She's gone on to do great things. She's head of medicine design at Pfizer, a really senior leadership role. She's led um, disciplines within the company in, um, in medicinal chemistry, in pharmacokinetics, dynamics, and the metabolism area. But what really is significant and shows the importance of the work that she does and that she's leading the effort to come up with Pfizer's no, um, novel COVID-19 oral treatment. 
fantastic scientist, a great leader within the industry. And I think it's worth noting this evening that um, she was awarded an honorary fellowship um, by the Royal Society of Chemistry this year. Only one of three fantastic scientists to whom this award was conferred. Um, it's wonderful to have them both tonight presenting their work. And I will pass on to Melinda for her to give her presentation. She will then pass on to Charlotte. At the end, the screen will come back to me so that I can um, address some of the questions to the speakers that we, you will have submitted. So enjoy this evening. And Melinda, over to you. Thank you very much, Nick. And good evening, everyone, or good morning, or good afternoon, wherever you are. It's really great to see so many of you here. I thought this evening I'd tell you something about how a chemist like me came to be researching the structure of biological tissues. And then at the end, just a little bit on how and why I became a scientist at all. So tissues like skin, tendons, bone, they all contain cells, of course, but actually the bulk of those materials is this material around the cells, the so-called extracellular matrix. So at the macroscopic level, the extracellular matrix is the material that defines the shape and the mechanical properties of our bones, our muscles, our tendons. At the microscopic length scale that I've shown you here, then the extracellular matrix is the three-dimensional scaffold that supports cells. But ultimately, I think the most important function of the extracellular matrix is that its detailed molecular structure tells the cells in the tissue how to behave. So a bone cell only behaves like a bone cell when it is in bone extracellular matrix. If you take the cells out of bone and put them in another tissue, they behave completely differently. Now, the key thing here is that as we age, our tissues degenerate. And what that means in practice is that the extracellular matrix structure changes. And so, of course, that changed extracellular matrix structure is telling cells to behave differently, and I'm afraid, always badly. So for the last 100 years or so, medicine has been treating degenerative diseases with drugs that aim to modify the cell behavior by taking up the drug and then the drug trying to act directly on the cell. But if you think about it, those drugs are fighting a bit of a losing battle if this surrounding matrix structure is still aberrant and still telling the cells to behave badly. And so my work's predicated on a rather different paradigm. Really, it's about can we treat the extracellular matrix to restore more normal cell behavior? And so that's what I've been doing for the last 15 years or so. But 20 years ago, I wasn't doing anything like this at all. I was a chemist studying the molecular structure of polymers and their phase transitions. Well, there was, as I suppose there always is, a turning point. So meet Rio. He was my turning point. Rio was a rescue horse who was given to me to retrain. I have to say that Rio was a complete delinquent when he arrived, and so I did what any sensible woman would do when faced with a crazy horse. As you can see, I gave him to my husband to ride. Now, the thing you need to know about Rio is that he had an unerring ability to fracture bones, mostly his own, but not always. And so when I met uh, equine vet and uh, Robinson fellow, Dr. Rachel Murray at lunch one day in college, it was inevitable that we got to talking about the molecular structure of bone and starting to speculate on what that structure might look like when the bone's fractured. And the more we talked, the more I realized that there's just so little known about the molecular structure of this incredibly important material in our bodies. And that's when I thought that maybe we could do something about that. Because I have to say, in my naivety, I thought, well, bone's just a collection of biopolymers, isn't it? A bit of inorganic mineral. And I know how to study the structure of polymers. How hard can it be? Well, the technique that I'd been using to study polymer structures and phase transitions was NMR spectroscopy. And here is one of our NMR spectrometers in the department. And this is Dr. Ying Chao who was one of my PhD students at the time. And as you can see, she really loves her work. Uh, she's actually just been appointed as an assistant professor at the University of Warwick. Now, NMR can be used to determine the spatial relationship between carbon atoms, between carbons and nitrogens, or phosphorus and hydrogens, or any combination. But to use it to study something as complicated as bone, bone intact native bone in the early 2000s was, I have to admit, right, widely regarded as somewhat bizarre. For a start, to study the organic molecules in bone, we'd need to have bones with large amounts of the isotopes carbon-13 and nitrogen-15. And those are stable, non-radioactive isotopes, of course, and 1% of the atoms in your body are carbon-13. But to do this kind of structural study, we knew we needed more like 20% carbon-13. 
And so we spent the next eight years finding ways to get carbon-13 into bones and other tissues and developing cell culture me uh, methods to grow bones and other tissues in the lab that were near identical to the real tissue. And I have to say, at that point, we were really taking a leap into the unknown because in all honesty, I couldn't have told you then what we might be able to find out from NMR about the structure of bone or any other tissue. Well, it's turned out that NMR can actually answer some really intriguing biological questions that there just hadn't been the techniques to tackle before. And especially when you work with, with biologists and you integrate NMR with all the techniques that biologists have at their disposal. So questions like, how is it that when our tissues are stretching and being pulled around all the time as we move, how is it that the cells in the tissue are not being pulled to and damaged? So the cells anchor themselves to collagen fibrils in our tissue. So collagen's a protein, it's a sort of rod-shaped uh, molecule I've indicated here schematically. And the thing about collagen molecules is that they align up with respect to each other very, very precisely in our tissues to form these so-called fibrils. And then cells stick to those collagen fibrils by proteins on the cell surface binding to very, very specific parts of the collagen molecule. Now, what we discovered by NMR is that right next to where the cells bind to the collagen molecule, the collagen molecules are very, very flexible. And then the really neat thing is that the way the molecules, the collagen molecules align in the fibrils, those flexible patches are actually lined up. And so they line up across the fibril. And you can see what effect that's going to have. If you think about just if you um, put your two hands together, one on top of the other with the flexible regions, the knuckles aligned and then bend your hands. And you can bend that construct really easily because the flexible regions are aligned. And that's what happens in our collagen fibrils. Aligning the flexible molecular patches makes a nice flexible band right next to where the collagen is binding to the cell. And that flexible region acts as a sort of a damper to stop the huge forces that can be exerted on collagen fibrils from being transmitted straight through into the collagen molecule. Now, if you take your two hands again, put them on top of each other, knuckles aligned, but now just slightly misalign the, the knuckles and now try bending. The whole construct now is really stiff. And that's what happens with aging. The collagen molecules misalign and that makes the collagen fibrils stiff and now the forces on the collagen fibrils are being transmitted largely straight into the cell. And that has a huge effect on how the cells behave and it causes them to start behaving really very aberrantly. Now, for many years, it was thought that the reason the collagen became stiffer with age was because it became chemically cross-linked. But actually what we found was that there's actually fewer uh, collagen cross-links as we age and actually the stiffening process is due to this misalignment. And that would probably explain why drugs that have been developed to stop collagen cross-linking actually had little effect on restoring normal tissue function. And actually now the right drug target we know is to try and realign collagen molecules in their correct alignment. That's a really tough nut to crack, but it's something we're working on. And I hope if I get the opportunity to talk to you again in maybe five or 10 years time, I'll be able to tell you about some of the solutions we've come up with there. So early on into my, uh, my journey into biology, I met Professor Kathy Shanahan. Now, Kathy's a well-renowned vascular biologist who works on hardening of the arteries or vascular calcification. We met at a conference and we started talking, I have to confess, mainly because she was the only other woman in the room and also partly because, like me, she'd grown up in Australia. Now, when I met Kathy in 2002, it was widely believed that vascular calcification is deposit of calcium phosphate mineral around atherosclerotic plaques in the inside of the the artery or directly into the artery wall it was a just simply a random process that occurred because the artery had been damaged. And if it's a random process, it's undruggable, it's untreatable. But Kathy didn't believe that. She was sure she'd seen evidence that this whole process was caused by stress cells in the artery wall that orchestrated the entire process in a manner very similar to the calcification of bone. And so given my interest in bone molecular structure and Kathy's in vascular calcification, we started to work together on exactly what the mineral was in both cases and how it got there. And so over the next few years, we delved deeper and deeper into the structure of calcified arteries and bone and found again and again, highly similar molecular structures responsible for the processes in the two cases. But the really difficult question that we just didn't seem to be able to answer 
was what is the molecule, what was the molecule that gathers the calcium ions, that initiates this whole process. So by NMR, we've been able to see that such a molecule existed and that it was a sugar polymer. We simply just couldn't identify what it was. It took us 12 years and it took an experiment to go wrong and for us to get unexpected results and then track back and work out what had happened to find that molecule. And the molecule responsible for putting calcium phosphate into our arteries and bones is this one, polyADP ribose. So polyADP ribose, when it encounters calcium, it binds really avidly to calcium ions, forms these dense liquid droplets. And in our arteries, stressed cells spit these things out into the surrounding extracellular matrix of the artery wall, where they, these droplets collect into the damaged areas and eventually solidify, producing the, the calcification. Now, what was so exciting about this for us is that now that we knew what the molecule was that was responsible for this, we could see how to stop this calcification happening in arteries because we simply needed to stop these stress cells from making polyADP ribose. So polyADP ribose, like most of the molecules in our cells, is made by an enzyme. And slowing enzyme activity is a well-trodden path in the pharmaceutical world. Enzymes are proteins and they work by binding the substrate molecule, the molecule they're gonna make, in this case, polyADP ribose out of, binding that substrate molecule into a very specific binding pocket in the enzyme protein. And so to stop that process happening, you find a drug molecule that will fit into that same binding pocket, but more strongly than the intended biological substrate molecule. So with a bit more work, Kathy and I worked out that of all the possible PARP enzymes, it's the PARP2 enzyme that's responsible for artery calcification, and so our task became finding a molecule to fit the binding pocket of part two. The problem was that by then, Kathy and I had no funding to carry on this work, and after two years of trying to find funding and not succeeding, we were about to give up. And then I had a chance meeting with an old student, James Harrison. So James is a chemist and a Robinson alum, and he just set up Psychopharmaceuticals, which was a uh, to focus on repurposing drugs for other uses and to formulate drugs for better patient use. And James understood immediately what it was we were trying to do. And so Cycle funded us and together we set about finding a molecule that would block this enzyme that starts vascular calcification. Now I'd really like to tell you that we used a very clever bit of AI or machine learning. Actually what happened to find the molecule that we targeted was James and I sat down, I think it was probably a rainy afternoon, and we searched through the existing drug database, looking for a molecule that looked like the right sort of shape and functionality to fit in what we then knew about the part two enzyme binding pocket, which quite frankly at that time wasn't very much. And then we ordered our candidates in a list um, in terms of how safe they would be for patients and how cheap, because if someone's suffering from hardening of the arteries, the likelihood is they're gonna to need to take this drug for many years. So it needs to be safe and it needs to be cheap. Top of our list came out minocycline, an old antibiotic. And really something must have been on our side because our very first in vitro experiments told us that we had a hit. And now some years later and considerably at large amounts of work later, there's a patient trial approved to begin in Addenbrooke's as soon as the uh, pandemic allows uh, patients to start being recruited into that. Now a very similar, but rather more regulated process happens to calcified bones. So bone cells push out these same polyADP ribose calcium droplets into the, this time the bone extracellular matrix. And there they bind onto specifically collagen fibrils. And that binding process initiates the nucleation of the mineral. And you get these beautiful ordered nanoscopic calcium phosphate crystals around the collagen fibrils. And that's entirely what our bones are made up of, these calcified collagen fibrils. But there's many other things in a bone extracellular matrix that these droplets could adhere to and calcify. Something is making them specifically calcify collagen fibrils, and that's obviously essential for the mechanical properties of our bones. And so we reasoned that there must be a specific binding site on the collagen that the polyADP ribose binds to, to initiate this uh, binding event and then the nucleation. And so we went looking for it. And just a few months ago, we found that binding site. We found how polyADP ribose binds to collagen. It actually binds at the very end of the collagen molecule here, where the collagen molecule folds back on itself and the polyADP ribose tucks itself into that fold. 
Now, what's really neat about that is that this same end of the collagen molecule sticks out of the collagen fibrils. And so it's really vulnerable to chemical attack. And in fact, if radicals attack it, it actually falls off entirely. But sugars attack it and anything that damages that folded structure there stops the polyadipy ribose binding and stops that neat calcification from happening. And what happens then instead is this really dystrophic, almost random precipitation of the mineral still around the collagen fibrils, but this is weak, a weak structure. And the more and more that we work on this, we're beginning to realize that this is a major underlying cause of the fragility of bones in aging and in metabolic diseases like diabetes. So to do something about it, of course, we need to put back the poly ADP ribose binding site on or near collagen in some sort of synthetic way. And that's what we're working on right now. And then about five years ago, I changed course again. I was musing one day that if cells take their cues from the surrounding extracellular matrix structure, can we change the way that cancer cells behave by changing their environment? So in tumors, as you know, cancer cells grow and divide very rapidly. And eventually some of the tumor cells start to leave the original site and start to make their way through the surrounding extracellular matrix of the tissue and take up sites elsewhere and form tumors in other tissues and further into that tissue. And that's of course how cancer spreads and that is the damaging part of cancer. And so I wondered, can we stop cancer cells from leaving that original tumor site by simply uh, strengthening the extracellular matrix around the tumor? And so I set up a company, Cambridge Oncology, with James Harrison and with another Cambridge alum, Sean Sutcliffe, and we started looking initially at brain cancers, specifically glioblastoma. And so to strengthen the extracellular matrix around the glioblastoma, we simply use chemical crosslinking. In this case, for glioblastoma, we use a, a crosslinkable biopolymer similar to hyaluronic acid, hyaluronic acid being a major component of brain, so it's a sort of biocompatible biopolymer. And we simply let that crosslinker diffuse around the tumor and crosslink the matrix around it. And it works. Um, when you don't do that, your cancer cells spread all over the place. And when you crosslink the matrix, you pretty much stop them in their tracks. And the other neat thing is that having trapped the cancer cells, they stay alive, but they lose their, that invasive phenotype. They actually lose the will, to, as it were, to try and move. And, but the real beauty of this process, I think, is that the crosslinkers we're using are not particularly toxic. They simply cross-link around the tumor and restrain the tumor from spreading. And so now we're working with surgeons to develop ways to apply these cross-linking drugs into the tumor margins during the uh, surgery to remove uh, the brain cancer. And by cross-linking the tumor margins that the surgeons simply can't take out, we would hope to trap any remaining cancer cells and stop them forming new tumors. And now I'm thinking beyond that to how is it that a cancer cell actually finds the weak points in a tissue to migrate through in the first place? So I was thinking as tumors grow, they strain the tissue around them. Now, if you put enough force on a molecule, any molecule, you can induce chemistry in that molecule, force-driven chemistry or mechanochemistry, if you like. And so I wondered if it was the case that as tumors grow to the point where they start to really strain the extracellular matrix around them, and maybe even tear that matrix, whether that force induces chemistry in the surrounding extracellular matrix proteins and whether the chemical products of that chemistry are detected by the cancer cells to say to the cancer cell, here's a weak point in the tissue, here's where you can invade. So we tried that, we, we tried simply by NMR looking at torn tissues and we found signals from chemistry that happens when you put force on a tissue. And I was lucky enough to get a European Research Council grant last year. And so now we're actually tracking down what the actual products, what the chemical products of that force driven chemistry on the tissue is, how cancer cells react to that. And if it is indeed the case that cancer cells react by choosing that those where those signals are as a path through which to invade, then we'll find ways to block it. And so how did I get to here? Well, <clears throat> I was born here in Luton. I spent quite a lot of time here growing up in Western Australia. And then after several more moves, I eventually ended up here in North Cornwall, where I attended the local comprehensive school, the Sir James Smith School. And there, a very excellent chemistry teacher, Mr. Trevithick, convinced me that I should apply to Cambridge to study natural sciences. 
and it did take some convincing. Both my parents had left school at age 15. They'd never had the opportunity for higher education. And so, yes, I was the first in my family to go to university, although my siblings both followed on close behind. And when I got to Cambridge, needless to say, it was a culture shock. But then I think a, a, any university is a culture shock for any teenager. But Cambridge really looked after me. And Cambridge gave me opportunities I hadn't even dreamt about. Not just in science, but in sport, in meeting like-minded people, people who are still my closest friends today. And why science? Well, I've thought about this really long and hard. And I, I do think one key factor is that my mother throughout my childhood was chronically ill, sometimes very seriously ill. Uh, and I missed a lot of school to look after her. And I think I latched onto science because the logic involved, the understanding that you can train yourself to have of science is very grounding when you're in an otherwise rather uncertain situation. I hate to admit it now, but actually when I was a teenager, I liked nothing better than having some differential equations to solve. But and I think along the same lines, another factor is that when you're in a family where everyone is rather distracted by more serious issues, your parents very rarely get around to telling you, you can't do something. And when I think of the things that my sister and I got up to, well, let's just say we had almost complete freedom to explore and find out things for ourselves, to question freely and openly. And I think maybe that really contributed to my love of exploration, to sort of pushing the boundaries and finding new things. And science research is just the best place to go if you like exploring. And I've really never lost that buzz you get when you find something new. And especially when you begin to realize that new thing could actually help improve somebody's quality of life. Because I think that's a really powerful driver for all of us, for all of my colleagues. So I hope I've given you at least a glimpse into what a Cambridge chemist is able to do when we have this wonderful research freedom and a bunch of brilliant, and I have to say mainly female collaborators to work with. And so with that, um, I'd like to pass you over to Charlotte. Good afternoon, everybody from uh, Cambridge in the United States, the new Cambridge, um, wherever you are in the world. And I just wanted to start by, by thanking you very much for the invitation to uh, present at this alumni event this afternoon, and also to congratulate Melinda on such a fantastic career. I was really captivated uh, by what you shared and thank Nick for the kind introduction. I'm going to share some personal reflections on my career and a summary of some of the research uh, that we have undertaken recently in Pfizer. And as part of that, I will be mentioning our oral uh, therapeutic for the treatment of COVID-19 Paxlovid. So I do need to just draw your attention to the disclaimer uh, shown on this slide, which we are asked to share uh, by the FDA, just clarifying that Paxlovid has not been approved, but it has been authorized for emergency use by the US FDA and the EUA. So um, my uh, story actually started in Suffolk in the UK, uh, where um, I still have very close ties, family and friends, and I'm a regular visitor there when travel allows. And um, at 18, thanks to uh, being inspired by a very good chemistry teacher, I headed off to the University of Nottingham to really deepen uh, my journey with chemistry. And I had an incredible uh, three years in Nottingham, another place that's very close to my heart, both deepening my knowledge uh, and particularly in organic chemistry, but building friends that remain with me to this day and an important part of my life. And at uh, the end of my time there, I was really drawn in two directions. One, similar to Melinda, I love mathematics, was taking me uh, towards an actuarial career. And the other was my love of organic chemistry and my deep interest in drug discovery, taking me towards the pharmaceutical industry. And, it was really a visit I made to the uh, Pfizer sandwich site that solidified the direction that I wanted to go and seeing the practical nature of the work that was going on and the direct link between some of the science that I've learned and having the potential to make a difference to human health that took me to sandwich in the UK and we all love the ham sandwich sign in uh, Kent, where I spent several years initially working in the area of synthesis technologies and looking at how we could expand the number of molecules we could make early in a program to find a good starting point on which to start a drug discovery program. So after a few years, I became increasingly interested really in the broader aspects of drug design and development and could definitely see the advantages of having a deeper academic uh, background that some of my colleagues coming in with PhDs and postdocs had. and was discussing that with uh, some of my managers in Pfizer, who kindly 
persuaded me to, uh, to stay with Pfizer and sponsored me to come to the University of Cambridge to Jesus College for a year to undertake an MPhil. And I joined the lab of uh, Professor Ian Patterson and uh, remain very grateful to him to this day for everything he invested in me, the mentorship he gave me, and the great things that I learned from him and the other students in his group. And of course, I had the advantage of coming out of industry and having the context uh, of the application of organic chemistry and drug discovery, which really made me hungry to learn as much as I could during my time at the University of Cambridge. And also the inclusivity of the department as Steve Lay allowed me to attend his problem sessions and other academics allowed me to attend uh, the lectures, whether for undergraduates or graduates. So I really made the most of my time there, again, made friends for life and remain very grateful to the University of Cambridge. I then uh, went back to Pfizer and spent the next uh, 10 years working in medicinal chemistry, both in Sandwich uh, in the UK, as well as in Japan, which was a, 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 an incredible experience. And then made a move from the medicinal chemistry department uh, to a department we call PDM or pharmacokinetics, dynamics and metabolism, which is really about what does our body do to drug molecules? How does it, how does it eliminate them? How, where does it allow them to distribute to? And using that knowledge to help us design drug molecules, but also describe molecules to regulators as part of the approval process. And, that role took me uh, from Sandwich in the UK, actually to Cambridge in the UK, and then ultimately over to Connecticut in the USA, and then finally up to Massachusetts, where I speak to you from uh, today, where I now lead an organization we call Medicine Design, which is bringing together the medicinal chemistry, the PDM, as well as some of the other scientific disciplines involved in the design of our oral therapeutics. Uh, for example, pharmacology screening, structural biology. I've had the opportunity to do many different things in Pfizer, for which I'm very grateful. Also work across three continents, five different family moves, and that really has given me different insights into different cultures, different ways of working, and has uh, really built my passion for diversity and inclusion and, and trying to build cultures where all colleagues feel they can bring their best to work every day. So as I mentioned, medicine design is really focused on ultimately designing and selecting the molecules that we take into clinical development to treat disease. And, you know, much like with our DNA, the properties of a molecule are determined at the moment of conception. And while we work with great clinical colleagues that can design great clinical trials to unveil their therapeutic value, or formulation scientists that can modify the profile Ultimately, whether a molecule will get to the right place in the body to do what it needs to do, stay there long enough, be able to be administered conveniently and modulate the biological target that we need it to safely to have the therapeutic potential that we want it to have all rests in the molecule that we select. And that's a fantastic opportunity for us. It's also a big responsibility for us and uh, one that we constantly are investing in, in terms of new science, a new technology to make us more and more effective. We have a long history of um, discovering and developing uh, small molecule therapeutics in Pfizer. I can in no way claim that I have played a major role in all the molecules uh, shown on this slide. Many uh, ahead of me played very important roles in that and many of my uh, colleagues in Pfizer today. We are excited most recently to have had the approval of Sabinco or abracitinib, which is our JAK1 inhibitor for the treatment of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. But today I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about uh, a couple of others. Firstly, Lor Brenner and Zal Khoury for the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer and also our oral therapeutic for the treatment of COVID-19 uh, Paxlovid. So shown on uh, this slide in the top corner is uh, crizotinib, which was approved in 2011 for the treatment of certain advanced non-small cell lung cancers, testing positive for the ALK fusion gene. Now, the ALK fusion genes are chromosomal alterations that are linked to the development of cancer, and crizotinib was designed to actually block the ALK fusion enzyme and in doing so prevent the progression of uh, tumours. And crizotinib and other first generation and second generation ALK-ROS inhibitors are very important uh, therapeutics for the treatment of non-small cell lung cancers. 
Unfortunately, though, as uh, is often the case, uh, the ALK enzyme can mutate, and over time it mutates, and because often it binds less well and therefore is less able to block the progression of the tumor. And also, unfortunately, some patients do go on to progress to have uh, brain metastases, and crizotinib does not distribute well into the brain uh, to address those tumors. So as always, our job really in medicine design is to be making certain that we continue to learn from the clinic and bring that data back into the design of future therapeutics. And that's uh, what we did in this case. We had a design team uh, that brought forward lorlatinib. And you can see from the structure of crizotinib here that, that really lorlatinib is building on that, but it's been tied around into this somewhat unique macrocyclic structure, which locks the molecule into a specific three-dimensional conformation, which enables it to be very potent across the ALK mutations. And also it brings with it a change in the physiochemical properties of the molecule, which allow it to cross the blood-brain barrier and to treat those brain metastases. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see some data from a recent clinical trial in ALK-positive non-small cell lung cancer patients that have previously been untreated. And the y-axis is the probability of being free of a brain metastasis or CNS progression, central nervous system progression over time uh, on the, on the uh, x-axis. And for patients that are on lorlatinib, you can see that the vast majority do stay free of brain metastases over time compared to unfortunately some patients progressing to form brain metastases on crizotinib. And at 12 months, the probability of being free of a brain metastases on lorlatinib is around 96% compared to 60% on crizotinib. And it's really that link between molecular structure, having uh, the right biological action and having a transformational impact on patients that certainly inspires uh, the work that we do. I'm now going to uh, change tact and uh, talk to you a little bit about some of our work on oral therapeutics for the treatment of COVID-19. And I don't think uh, COVID-19 um, needs uh, any introduction, sadly, to this audience. Everyone's been very impacted by that. And I don't expect the viral life cycle shown on the left-hand side of the slide needs much introduction either. But just briefly, uh, as we know, the viral, virus particles uh, enter our body, mostly through our respiratory tracts. And then they can enter our cells through an interaction between the spike proteins and receptors on the cell surface. And once inside our cells, they're essentially um, taking over our cell machinery to enable their own uh, replication. And you can see they release the viral RNA, which is then translated into these two large polyproteins. And these are then broken up into smaller proteins by the main protease and those smaller proteins go on to form some of the viral replication machinery and nucleoside inhibitors tend to have their mechanism of action at that stage. We decided to uh, target the main protease uh, and um, design a molecule that would block that or inhibit it. And in doing so prevent the breakup of the large polyproteins and essentially shut down uh, viral replication. So on the right-hand side of the slide here, you can see one of the polyprotein substrates uh, that are processed by the main protease. And the uh, protease actually cleaves these polyprotein uh, substrates in 11 distinct locations. And you can see uh, a cartoon of the protease uh, with the sulfur from the cysteine in the active site. And that sulfur breaks the amide bond that I've shown in red. And all the amino acids to the left of the uh, broken um, amide bond are labeled P1 through P4, as is common nomenclature in the protease field. What was particularly interesting about uh, this viral protease are that it only recognized a substrate that had a glutamine in position uh, P1. And what we knew is that other human proteases did not recognize substrates that had a glutamine in position P1. And so that gave us confidence that we would be able to design a molecule that could block this viral protease and not interact with human proteases, giving us encouragement that we would be able to find a, a safe inhibitor. On the bottom of the slide, 
uh, is a molecule that we had actually identified back in 2003 when we've been looking for inhibitors of a protease for the treatment of SARS uh, during that coronavirus outbreak. And you can see uh, that it was designed to mimic uh, the polypeptide structures that are processed uh, by the proteases. Now, what we knew is actually the SARS protease is very similar to the SARS-CoV-2 protease. So we were able to confirm very quickly that this molecule uh, was also a potent inhibitor of the SARS-CoV-2 main protease. Unfortunately, though, it had been designed for intravenous administration, uh, meaning that if we were to swallow it, um, it would uh, um, not be able to cross our gut wall and very little of it would get into the systemic circulation uh, to treat the virus. And we really wanted an oral therapeutic so that we could treat early in disease and prevent uh, people progressing to the very severe COVID-19 and to hospitalization. So we set about uh, designing an oral SARS-CoV-2 main protease inhibitor uh, building off parts of the structure shown here, where we had included a glutamine mimetic in the position P1 to try and keep the good selectivity. And in this position of the molecule, we were building in what we call cysteine traps, which were groups that could react uh, with the sulfur from the cysteine and the protease and form a covalent reversible bond. And through that interaction and the interaction of the P1 to P4 substituents really fit into the binding blocket and prevent it from processing the polyproteins and in doing so prevent uh, viral replication. Ultimately, uh, in a four month drug discovery program enabled by uh, some very committed colleagues, as well as many of our investments in uh, AI and structure based drug design that enabled us to move quickly, we identified the molecule shown here, which is Nermotrelvia. As you can see, it's a very potent binder uh, to the SARS CoV 2 main protease. And in doing that, it also has great antiviral activity in cells. We maintained that glutamine mimetic in the P1 position, which gave us the selectivity uh, that we were looking for. And in this case, we had substituted uh, the cysteine trap. Uh, we had a, a nitrile as the cysteine uh, trap. If you um, look on the right hand side, we have the crystal structure of uh, the molecule, Nermotrelvia, bound into the active site of the main protease. Uh, the protease is shown in the gray ribbons with some of the specific amino acids shown in bright green and the molecule is shown in bright blue and uh, for the eagle-eyed amongst you you might see the cysteine 145 uh, with the yellow sulfur has actually reacted uh, with the nitrile in a reversible covalent manner forming some key interactions and that together with other key interactions uh, between the molecule and the binding pocket enable that very potent inhibition. Now, nermotrelvir is broken down in the liver by enzymes, as is very common with oral therapeutics uh, called CYP enzymes. And so we decided to co-administer it with a PK booster that blocks those enzymes called ritonavir, and in doing so, really boost the exposures of nermotrelvir, which we wanted to maximize in order to be confident of clinical efficacy and also potentially reduce uh, the emergence of resistance mutations, which can be known to happen uh, with protease inhibitors. And nomotrelvir and ritonavir together make Paxlovid. And we were very pleased to be able to share at the end of last year that Paxlovid reduced the risk of hospitalization or death by 89% in an interim analysis. And then the full data set from our phase two, three trial in high risk uh, patients. And, um, uh, it's gone on to achieve emergency authorization in very various countries around the world. And again, to us, it's a, another nice example of uh, a link between molecular structure being a potent inhibitor of the target and an impact on healthcare. And with that, I'm going to finish by uh, uh, sharing uh, some personal reflections, which I've been asked to do, particularly under the theme of uh, women in chemistry, uh, which is one of the focuses of today. And um, it's fair to say, I always start by saying I've only ever been a woman in chemistry, so I don't have any direct comparisons that I can make. Um, but for sure, during my career, I have been greatly enabled by uh, strong networks, coaches, mentor, both men and women 
um, that have uh, helped me progress, helped me to learn. And I mentioned some of the ones from my time uh, at the University of Cambridge earlier. There's definitely been times when, uh, you know, I feel that uh, I've been able to contribute my best and thrive and other times where that hasn't been so easy. Uh, and I think all of us have probably experienced that regardless of race or gender and our energy uh, in those different situations can be markedly different. And I often reflect on that and that has built in a strong desire to keep working, uh, certainly in my organizations on the culture where everybody feels they can bring their best to work every day. I think there's plenty of data uh, available that shows diverse teams are the most high performing teams. And particularly over the last couple of years with some of the work right across the industry and academia to enable therapeutics and vaccines for COVID-19, I've often reflected on the diversity of the teams that have enabled that work over many uh, decades. And I think that's a great example of it. Um, I once attended a talk uh, many years ago, actually, where somebody said something that really resonated with me and I sort of have taken as my guiding principle uh, throughout uh, my career, which is, firstly, you have, to, uh, you have to believe that you have a right to be there. You have to uh, battle the imposter syndrome that can come uh, with many of us. And uh, uh, secondly, that you have to believe that you have a contribution to make and look to how you can best make that contribution. And you also need to be willing to take the risk. Uh, to test your hypotheses. Sometimes you'll be right, sometimes you'll be wrong, uh, and to be resilient and keep moving those forward. And uh, those are things that I uh, uh, try and take with me every day. And with that, I'll thank you again very much for the invitation and hand back to Nick. <laughs>